Hello, good morning everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the RSA and this great room. Uh, my name is Rachel O'Brien and amongst other things I've led the RSA's prison work for about 10 years, which is probably a fraction of what most of you have done. <laughs> this has included our future prison program, which some of you here have been involved in and which will continue this year. I'm not going to talk in detail, I'm going to hand over, but just to say what's united this work is an emphasis on the need for a more localised central, um, for, sorry, a sustained central government focus on raising standards and on rehabilitation, coupled with a more localised approach um, that allows governors to govern, uh, seize the potential of prisons and staff and communities to drive reform. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what the Secretary of State has to say. But first, thank you all for coming out for what is an early start, um, and thank you to the RSA team and for RSA hosting us. Just a quick note, as ever, please put your phones onto silent. Um, we are filming today, so there's people out um, there. Hello, too. Um, if you want to join the debate online, please use the hashtag, hashtag RSA Prisons, and you can get in the, involved in the conversation, conversation on Twitter. Right, now that's out of the way, it's my great pleasure to welcome this morning's distinguished guest speaker, the Right Honourable David Goke, MP, Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice. David is the Conservative MP for Hartford South West and was previously Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. Appointed to the role of Justice Secretary in January this year, this is his first major speech since taking out the position. Please join me in welcoming David. Well, thank you, Rachel, uh, for that introduction and for the work you and the RSA do on prison reform and the important contribution you make to public policy in this area. It is a huge privilege to have been appointed Justice Secretary, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to set out my thoughts after two months in post on our prison system. Depriving someone of their liberty for a period of time is one of the most significant powers available to the state and must be imposed with respect for the rule of law and with purpose. Prison is the sharp end of our justice system. By imposing this serious sanction, we must be clear about what prison is for. I believe its purpose is threefold. First, protection of the public. Prison protects the public from the most dangerous and violent individuals. Second, punishment. Prison deprives offenders of their liberty and certain freedoms enjoyed by the rest of society and acts as a deterrent. It is not the only sanction available, but it is an important one. And third, rehabilitation. Prison provides offenders with the opportunity to reflect on and take responsibility for their crimes and pre prepare them for a law-abiding life when they are released. It is only by pri prioritising rehabilitation that we can reduce reoffending and in turn the numbers of future victims of crime. And yet it's clear that prisons don't always achieve what they are there to do. The reasons for this are varied and complex, but I'm determined to ensure prisons can fulfil those three purposes I have set out. As the Minister for Prisons, Rory Stewart, has made clear, for prisons to be effective, we must get the basics right. Getting the basics right means creating prisons that are secure, with the physical integrity of the prison a priority to prevent prisoners from getting out and drugs, mobile phones and other contraband from getting in. It means creating prisons that are safe, with orderly, purposeful and structured regimes, free from violence, intimidation and self-harm. And it means creating prisons that are decent, with clean wings and humane living conditions. It is clear that some of our prisons have, frankly, fallen below the standards that we expect. I want the prison service to have a relentless focus on these fundamentals in the months ahead. That's why I'm giving renewed focus to our programme of prison maintenance to drive the much-needed improvements to our estate. I will also carry on with my predecessor, David Liddington's important work to ensure inspection reports are acted upon. I'm also continuing to push hard on proving, improving not just the number of prison officers, but also how we deploy them. Liz Truss, as Secretary of State, committed to raising the number of prison officers 
by 2,500 by the end of this year. I'm pleased to say that we're on track to deliver those officers and ended last year with the highest number of officers in post since 2013. The reason increased staffing levels are important is that they are allowing us to introduce a new key worker model with prison officers spending much more time one-to-one -one, with small groups of prisoners. As we introduce this new model, we should start to see, start to make a difference in the levels of violence we are seeing, which are currently far too high. 28,000 incidents were recorded in our prisons last year alone. That figure includes 20,246 attacks by prisoners against fellow inmates and 7,828 assaults against prison officers by prisoners. The violence against prison officers is particularly shocking. No prison officer should go to work in fear for their safety simply for doing their job. I want to take this opportunity to thank the thousands of prison staff across the country who do incredibly important work each and every day. By its nature, the work is often hidden from view, but it protects the public and keeps our prisons secure and prisoners safe. And I want to thank the families of prison staff. As the son of a police officer, I know the worries they carry and the pride they take in knowing their loved one is performing such an important public service. Increasing the numbers of prison officers and deploying them in a more effective way will help create more positive relationships between offenders and prison officers. But if we are to bear down on the levels of violence we are seeing, we need to deal with the biggest cause of the violence, which is drugs. Now, the problem of drugs entering and circulating in our prison system has always been a challenge. But the nature of the challenge has changed over the past few years, with the emergence of cheap and highly addictive new psychoactive substances, like spice, in our prisons. Something exploited by criminal gangs who have capitalised on the control they can exert and the money they can bring in. After all, what better place to target than a captive market made up of some of society's most susceptible and vulnerable groups when it comes to drug use and addiction? The economics mean that spice can sell in prison for many times its street value, bringing in a healthy return for the criminals. At the same time, it is relatively cheap to buy in prison compared to other drugs, so is financially attractive for prisoners. In exploiting the emergence of new psychoactive substances, prisons have proved a perfect marketplace for the criminal gangs, and for our prisons it has created a perfect stall. And while there has always been low-level networks dealing in cigarettes or illegal contraband, the criminal networks and supply chains have recently got larger and more complex, and new technologies have empowered gangs to be more sophisticated and brazen about the way drugs are smuggled in. Many of you will be aware of the kind of things I'm talking about. Spice and other drugs ordered with a Deliveroo-style responsiveness on tiny mobile phones from prison cells and delivered by drones direct to cell windows. The paint used in supposed children's drawings sent to their parents in prison laced with liquid psychoactive drugs, or the pages of fake legal letters purporting to be from a prisoner's solicitor soaked in drugs. Gangs engineering situations where a prisoner who has been released from prison deliberately breaches their license conditions they are, so they are sent back to smuggle in more drugs. Gangs enforcing control by using threats and violence towards prisoners, extorting their families and attempting to corrupt prison staff. From the conventional to the cunning, by design or device, through fear or intimidation, these criminal gangs will stop at nothing to maintain their access to such a lucrative market. We need to make prison less congenial for the modern-day Harry Grouts. It is clear that the reason drugs are so prevalent in our prisons is in large part because gangs are fueling demand, boosting the supply and catching prisoners in a cycle of debt and further criminality from which they struggle to break free. As I've been visiting prisons, the conversations I've had so far with prison governors have brought home to me the scale and nature of the criminal gang activity and the impact of drugs in our prisons. Governors tell me that it's not just when the drugs come in that there is an issue. 
but a couple of weeks later when they see a spike in violence, a spike caused by prisoners carrying out attacks on fellow inmates and on staff as a repayment in kind to pay back debts that have accrued by taking the drugs. And it's not just about attacks on other inmates or staff. We are seeing a rise in the incidence of self-harm. Last year, there were 42,837 incidents of self-harm in our prisons, involving 11,428 individuals. These statistics, together with the figures for assaults I've highlighted earlier, are sobering. But they only give us half the story. Behind all the numbers is a catalogue of physical and mental injury, of intimidation and of abuse. I've been shocked and sickened watching some of the videos filmed by prisoners using illicit mobile phones that are posted on social media. They show the terrifying and debilitating impact spice can have on the drug and the drug fueled violence and humiliation it unleashes. One of these videos shows inmates laughing and joking as the spice takes over the mind and body of a fellow prisoner. The effect is immediate and shocking. Within a few seconds, they're having a fit on the floor. Another video shows two naked prisoners believing they are dogs with makeshift muzzles and leads around their necks, barking at and fighting each other, goaded on by other prisoners. Another shows a prisoner climbing into a tumble dryer in the prison laundry room. Other prisoners then turn the machine on and he is spun around inside, a dangerous act of humiliation to earn himself some more spice. And I'm afraid these videos are merely a short snapshot of a grim reality. Many of the attacks against prison officers have been linked to spice. Last year, for example, a prisoner viciously attacked an officer with a table leg at HMP Northumberland after the officer intervened to break up a fight the attack left him with bruising and tissue damage. The prisoner had no memory of the attack and subsequently described the officer as being a nice man who was thoroughly decent towards him whilst he was in prison. Cases like this show how starkly drugs like spice are leading to violence and undermining efforts to create safe environments and respectful relationships in prisons. And it's clearly not just physical damage that drugs like spice cause. There's an enormous toll on the mental health of prisoners, often exacerbating existing mental health conditions and long-term issues with alcohol and drug abuse. Prison staff have a key role to identify and support prisoners with mental health needs. That's why we are investing in more mental health awareness training for staff. We've also increased our grant to the Samaritans to fund the continued delivery of a peer support scheme called Listeners, which supports prisoner mental health. We must ensure offenders have access to the treatment that they need to come off drugs and support their recovery, whether that's in the prison or in the community. That's why we've, worked, we've been working with the Ministry of Health and Social Care and others to improve access to mental health and substance abuse services for offenders, including agreeing a clear set of standards across all the various agencies involved. Now, every prisoner who attends one of these drug agencies will have their own story about what happened to them, and it will very often involve, in some way, criminal gangs. This government has undertaken many important reforms, and cracking down on drugs and criminality has always been, and remains, a priority. But the sophistication and reach of these criminal gangs into our prisons is a relatively recent development. It is therefore right that we continue to adjust our approach to tackling it. So today I'm doubling down on our commitment to target organised criminal gangs and cut off their ability to do business in our prisons. That's why I can announce today that we're investing £14 million to tackle the threat of serious and organised crime against our prisons. This includes creating new intelligence and serious and organised crime teams. Working with the National Crime Agency, they will enhance our intelligence and information gathering capability across the country to help us identify and stop the gang's ability to operate in our prisons. This improved intelligence picture is already delivering major successes, including at least 30 successful convictions for drone activity following joint intelligence-led operations. And, December, and in December, following an investigation by prison intelligence officers and police, 11 gang men members were handed sentences totaling over 32 years 
for using drones to smuggle drugs, weapons and mobile phones into prison. To build on that success, I can also announce today that we are installing technology at 30 prisons that will allow officers to quickly download data from illicit phones seized from prisoners. This means officers can access information on a phone on the same day it is seized, rather than having to send it away to be processed, something that can currently take months. If a phone has details about an expected drone drop later that day, officers will be able to know where, how and when, and can act on that intelligence and intercept it. In doing so, we will be able to collect vital intelligence about the criminal's contacts and associates, who they are buying from and selling to, and the bank accounts they are using. This will help us to stop drugs getting in and give the police the intelligence they need to target the source of the drugs. But technology can't be the only solution to tackling gangs. The fact is, there are around 6,500 prisoners who have links to organised crime. At the moment, these offenders are spread across the estate and are helping to perpetuate the cycle of crime by drawing fellow prisoners into the clutches of the gangs. So I want to rethink how we categorise prisoners. That means looking again at who goes to higher security prisons. Rather than just considering their length of sentence and risk of escape in determining which prison an offender goes to or moves to, I want to look as well at their behaviour in prison and their risk of directing crime and violence whilst in prison. This would ensure that those ringleaders who ostensibly behave but have others do their bidding would be cut off from their network and prevent them from operating. Removing the ringleaders also means that prisons can then focus on maintaining an orderly environment and, crucially, get on with helping prisoners rehabilitate so that they don't reoffend when they leave prison. We have to make it absolutely clear to prisoners that the path of further criminality only leads to more punishment and less freedom, but that there is another, better way. A better way for them and the whole of society. Reoffending and the cycle of crime cost society £15 billion a year. It creates more victims and it leads to the perpetuation of unfulfilled potential on the part of offenders. If the third and final purpose of prison is for rehabilitation, then we need to look again at what works. I believe rehabilitation starts with conformity with the prison rules and a rejection of further criminality, a commitment to change and an embrace of opportunities that help offenders to leave prison as law-abiding and tax-paying citizens. I want to make those the desirable and attainable choices that prisoners make. I believe harnessing the power of incentives in our prison is an important way to do that. My experience and the large amount of research out there shows that incentives work. As Secretary of State at the Department for Work and Pensions, I saw how a mixture of positive incentives, support and sanctions can influence behaviour and help people change their lives for the better. For example, the incentive of making work always pay more than benefits is a fundamental principle of our welfare system and has helped bring about record levels of employment in this country. I believe we can not only make prisons safer and more secure, but also help to break the cycle of reoffending, supporting and incentivising people to make the right choices that will prepare them to lead crime-free lives when they leave prison. An offender's experience in prison is too often one of detention and boredom, which leads to drug abuse and despondency, which in turn leads to debt and despair. I'm clear that offenders go to prison as punishment, not for punishment. So I want prisons to be the best place, to be places of humanity, hope and aspiration. I want prisoners to know that there is a route to a better life, that there is a life to be had free from the clutches of gangs and free from the intimidation and abuse. And that the route to that better life is through purposeful activity, through education, through skills and through employment. The way I see it is that prisoners have a contract with the state. By serving your sentence and conforming to the rules, you are repaying your debt to society. If you do that, you will find that the state and the prison system backing you up, 
supporting you, and you will be able to earn greater rights and privileges. This is beneficial for prisoners, but even more so for wider society. So I want to reset and reinvigorate the system of incentives in our prisons so that they work much more in the favour of those prisoners who play by the rules and who want to turn their lives around, whilst coming down harder on those who show no intention of doing so. However, prisoners should be under no illusions that a failure to abide by the rules will be met with strong sanctions. I'm supportive of the steps that have been taken to improve the punishment of unacceptable and illegal behaviour in prisons. Just the other month, we introduced a new protocol between the Ministry of Justice and the CPS to ensure that where there is sufficient evidence, we bring to justice prisoners who commit violent attacks against prison officers and other prisoners. But for those offenders who see their time in prison as a genuine opportunity to reflect and take responsibility for their crime and to be rehabilitated, to build the skills and behaviour they need to rejoin society, I want to create the incentives that will support and encourage them in that effort. That means prisoners having the opportunity to earn rights and freedoms, an opportunity to live in a more liberal environment with greater personal responsibility and therefore have more to lose if they fall foul of the rules. After all, incentives are given and they can be taken away. I know that prison governors feel strongly that the current approach to using incentives in our prisons is not working. I hear that. I also know that governors want more flexibility for what and how incentives are used in their own prisons. I agree. I believe governors should govern. They are the best judge for what will work best in their prison. So this is not about me imposing a top-down system or a list of incentives, but I do want to give a couple of examples of where I think we can more effectively use incentives. Prisons are required to provide a minimum amount of contact between an offender and their family whilst in prison. I think we could reinforce good behaviour by offering a prisoner extra and additional time to see family members, for example by using technology like Skype to allow contact they would otherwise be unable to have. Another example is giving an offender a better prospect of securing a job after release by providing access to certain training and experience. For example, I want to look at the availability and use of release on temporary licence. Specifically, I want to look to see how we can use Rottle to allow more prisoners who have earned it to have a routine where they, with close monitoring, leave prison each day to go to work nearby. Now, I've seen how getting and keeping a job can change people's lives. The prison and probation service have an important role to help uh, offenders build the skills and experience they need whilst they're in prison so they can have the right attitude for work and get a job when they're released. To do that, prisoners and probation need to act more as brokers between prisoners and the local community, employers and education and skills providers. We will shortly be launching our education and employment strategy that will set out our approach to helping offenders get the skills they need to find a job and avoid the activities that landed them in prison in the first place. Having a job after release is a crucial factor that determines likelihood of reoffending. But it is only one of several. For someone coming out of prison, having a place to live and access to mental and physical health treatments are also critical. In this sense, reoffending is not solely a justice problem for my department, but it is a wider issue about social justice and ensuring that offenders, many of whom have complex backgrounds, are not dismissed as part of society. We need a cross-government approach to reoffending. That's why I can announce today that I will be convening a cross-government group of senior ministers with the full backing of the Prime Minister to work across all relevant departments to reduce reoffending and the £15 billion cost of reoffending to society as a whole. This approach means that we can target prisoners and ex-offenders with the support they need to find a job, a home, to get help with debt or to get treatment for a drug addiction or, as I mentioned earlier, a mental health issue. I met with my Cabinet colleagues yesterday to discuss this and I am encouraged that there is a consensus on the mission and energy and the energy to make real progress. Now I'm clear about what purpose our prisons serve, protection, punishment and rehabilitation. 
But for prisons to do this well, we must get the basics of a safe, secure and decent environment right. Only an immediate and relentless focus on maintenance, infrastructure and staffing will allow us to make further progress, and we are acting on that. The basics matter because organised criminal gangs have cynically and systematically exploited the rise of a drugs problem in new psychoactive substances. We are taking action to bolster our defences at the prison gate, whilst also going after the organised criminal gangs. I want them to know that as a result of the action we are taking, they have no place to hide. Through our covert and intelligence-led operations, we will track them down removing their influence from our prisons so that they can become places of hope, not despair, of aspiration, not assaults. Because my approach is a practical one, based on what works and what's right, supporting prisoners to make the right choices and take the right path towards rehabilitation and rejoining society. I know that incentives work, and I want to put them to work in our prisons. By doing that, our prisons will not only be safer, more secure and more decent, but will support prisoners to do the right thing and turn their back on crime for good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary of State. Right, we've got, how much time we've got? We've got um, about half an hour. And I'm going to take some questions for the media first and then... If you can be patient, I'll take some questions from the floor. So, um, first of all, I'm, I'm really blind, so, um, from, from some of the journalists here. Jenny Shaw, BBC. Sorry, I couldn't see. Oh, thank you. Secretary of State, uh, your predecessor, David Liddington, said explicitly that he wanted to cut the prison population. Do you agree with him? Yes, I have that aspiration as well. Um, but I, I want to make this clear, uh, if people need to go to prison, we've got to have the prison places there, um, that uh, if we are to cut the prison population, we need to tackle re-offending, we need to make sure that there are strong non-custodial sentences that are out there uh, that are working, um, but if we can do that... I think it is right that we look to bring that prison population down. But I don't want to have an artificial target. I don't want to say, you know, it's got to be down to a certain number by a particular point. That depends on us achieving the objectives that we need to achieve. But we do have a very high uh, prison population. Uh, and if we can bring it down by pursuing these policies successfully, then I would be delighted. More, another, another question yeah. from the media? Sorry? Joshua, yeah. Richard. No, Joshua. Joshua. Uh, Joshua Rosenberg. Can I follow yes, up that question from Danny Shaw? Do you think the proposals that you have announced today will increase the prison population by convicting more gangs of smuggling and, and so on, or reduce the prison population by uh, leading to rehabilitation? I think there's opportunity to uh, reduce crime and therefore reduce the uh, criminal population and the prison population. Uh, the reason why I say that is that we need to focus on uh, those people who, if you like, are in prison, who are manipulating others, creating greater violence, uh, creating a greater dependency on drugs. That is holding back people from being rehabilitated. And if we can isolate those individuals who are already in prison, uh, but isolate them so that they don't have access to the networks that they uh, currently do, then I think that can be, we can see a shift in what happens within prisons. Uh, and, and that enables us to make progress in terms of prisons being used for rehabilitation. I've got, I know Richard Ford. Richard? Does your Question? Um, recategorization, will it effectively mean that more people could be actually moved down the system? And have you actually got the spaces in the category C and B estates to do this? Well, we'll be setting out the details uh, in, in due course. But the approach I want to take, as I, as I touched on in my speech, is that we place greater weight on behaviour within prison. Uh, not just in terms of what people directly do, but the way that they might manipulate others. Uh, and so if we place greater weight on that, 
uh, then I think we can focus on the kingpins, not everybody that's involved in uh, necessarily organized crime, but those key figures. And this is going to be intelligence-led, uh, identifying the people that we uh, need to. And, and I think as we place greater weight on that, uh, we can make an assessment of, of what our needs are within the various categories of, of prison. A couple more questions from journalists. Can you say who you are, please? Robert Wright from the Financial Times. Um, Secretary of State, I think a lot of people would think that potentially the approach you've laid out today is putting the cart before the horse in that I think a lot of people think that the problems of drugs and so on are a result of the overcrowding and the miserable conditions in prison um, r rather than a result and the criminality feeds off that. Are, are you, is this the right way around the approach that you've outlined today? Well, I made it very clear in my opening remarks that we've got to get the basics right. And um, the focus on, for example, cleanliness, the focus on uh, making sure that, uh, uh, that, that people have humane and clean conditions um, is, is absolutely key. It is, it is necessary. I accept that there can be a feeding off between the two. But you know, give you an example, hear reports of, we see a lot of broken windows. Those are bad conditions, but very often you know, there are cases where windows are broken in order to allow drones to get <coughs> drugs in. Uh, the two feed off each other, so it's not a question of dealing with one and not the other. I think we have to deal with both. But what we're setting out in terms of that focus of getting the basics right and also the focus on organised crime, I think is a coherent approach in, in addressing the challenges that we face. Uh, two more media questions. One, one young lady there. Yeah. Secretary of State, thank you. Thank you for that speech. Um, Secretary of State, your department and NOMS for four Can you years. Stay Sorry? Can you stay with oh, I'm Zubeda Hack. I'm Zubeda Hack from the Renumi Trust. Um, and take media questions first and come back to that. Is that right? Sorry? We're going to take questions from the media and come back to, to the audience. I'll come back to oh. you in a minute. Is that right? Because some people have to go. Just next to you. <clears throat> Uh, hi, um, it's Steve Hawkes at The Sun. Can I ask two things? Firstly, um, there seems to be a common thread through this quite shocking picture of prisons is mobile phones. Um, can you update us on what's happened with this trial of blocking mobile phone signals? I believe that was supposed to be introduced at three prisons early last year. What's happened to that and how is it still possible that prisons are able to you know, use a phone for a delivery style takeaway as such. Secondly, um, I know you may be constrained somewhat, but how concerned are you as Lord Chancellor about reports of the attack in Salisbury and the idea that a foreign power could carry out an attack such as this? First to take the, the, the first point, the, the Salisbury attack. Um, uh, look, there's, there's a police investigation into this matter. It is an operational matter and, and I don't want to be uh, drawn into that at, at this stage and I don't think it would be helpful for me to uh, speculate. Uh, in terms of uh, blocking technology, yes, we are making progress on that. You're right, there's uh, uh, announced a, a, a £2 million uh, investment in terms of uh, blocking uh, mobile phones at particular prisons. Uh, I expect to say a little bit more on that in, in due course, um, but uh, uh, just a, if uh, you'll bear with me, I shall uh, uh, be saying more uh, shortly in terms of uh, that matter. Okay, a couple more media ones, one at the back here. Oh, sorry, over here. Uh, Matthew Gundall, Channel 4 News. Um, isn't it the case that uh, you, uh, you obviously have increased prison officer numbers, but isn't it the case that you need to go, that the incidents over the last few years show that you do need to go further? And secondly, specific on, on uh, Salisbury again, what does it say about our country that this is uh, that Russian um, that Russian citizens it would seem can be uh, this things like this can happen to them without um, any sort of response well look, it, it, as I said uh, to, to Steve's question I don't think I should um, speculate um, uh, at, at, at this stage there's obviously a, a police investigation uh, going on um, as, a, as, a, as Lord Chancellor, I'm committed to the rule of law and uh, therefore jumping to uh, conclusions I don't think would be appropriate for me. Um, in terms of staff numbers, 
It is the case that we are increasing staff numbers, as uh, my predecessor, but one uh, announced in, in, in 2016, we were going to recruit an additional 2,500 uh, prison officers. We are on track in terms of that recruitment. Uh, we also need to ensure that uh, those uh, officers uh, build up the experience that they need, and I think that's, that's very important. But we have to ensure that we deploy those prison officers as most effectively as possible. And that's what I'm focused to do. But as I say, we are increasing prison officers. The, the numbers now are higher than they have been since uh, 2013. And that is an important part of what we are doing to improve our uh, prison service. I'm going to take one more question. Is, is Hayden Smith, did you have a question? You go, you go. Uh, thank you. Alan Travis from The Guardian, uh, Justice Secretary. Um, Successive uh, Home Secretaries and Justice Secretaries dating back to Sir Samuel Hoare in 1935 have advocated the closure of our decrepit and filthy Victorian prisons and they're under a new for old policy, most recently uh, revived by Michael Gove. Uh, uh, is there any chance whatsoever, is that policy now completely ruled out, ruled, out, ruled out and off the table between now and the next general election, given the events in, uh, recent events in Liverpool and in our other inner city prisons? No, no, there, there's still um, uh, that, that, that programme uh, in place uh, and uh, the case for a more up-to-date uh, uh, prison estate is, is, a, is a very strong one. Uh, we obviously have to uh, spend our money in the most effective way uh, possible, but I think there is a strong case for ensuring that we have got uh, more modern prison conditions. Uh, and that can help us uh, make progress in terms of, for example, rehabilitation. I'm struck by some of the challenges that the uh, older prisons have, if you like, in terms of having the facilities for training, uh, for example. And that's something that we need to, uh, need to uh, uh, give due consideration to. So uh, I hear that, that case. We obviously live within uh, constrained uh, circumstances in terms of the finances. Uh, but the case for more modern, up-to-date uh, uh, prison estate is, remains a strong one. I want to move on now to, to the other members of the audience. So I'm going to take uh, two at a time. So if you can put your hands up and I will um, get the microphone to you. Uh, Peter Dawson, first of all, and then a question from the front here. Yeah, Peter Dawson from the Prison Reform Trust. Um, Secretary of State, last autumn in the budget, your predecessor promised to take £400 million out of the running costs of your department. Given what you've told us today and your ambitions for prisons, can we assume that none of those cuts come from prisons? Well, it is the case that um, uh, we uh, have a budget in which to, to live, in, live within, uh, that uh, we face as a country difficult uh, financial circumstances in terms of the public finances. Uh, and uh, the MOJ and the prison services had to play a part in terms of that fiscal consolidation. And I don't think you know, one can credibly walk away uh, from that. But I am very keen to ensure that we deploy resources as effectively as possible, uh, we, that we get uh, the best return on what we do. Uh, and uh, you know, I want to ensure that we've got a prison system that is able to do what it needs to do. And I've set out today precisely what I think it needs to be doing. So I take two, and I will. So um, over this side. Excuse me. Um, so one here, the, please. Don't forget the Ronnie Mead Trust person. Sorry? Don't forget the Ronnie Mead Trust person in the back. Um, and, and then the Ronnie Mead Trust at the back. Sorry, uh, yes. Do you want to go first as you've got the microphone? I'll come back to you if you can be patient. Yes, please. <laughs> Hopefully, I won't have to sit down again. Um, Secretary of State, for four years, your department funded the Ronnie Mead Trust. Sorry, I'm Zubeda Hack. The Ronnie Mead Trust and the University of Law Faculty. Uh, Law Faculty. Greenwich um, Law Faculty to do work in prisons. We worked in several prisons for four years um, and we uh, looked at safety in prisons, we looked at mental health in prisons, we looked at deaths in custody in prisons and we looked at how the situation has got worse for black and ethnic minority prisoners for four years. That was four years of research that we did and we came back to the department and we explained to you in many reports many of which didn't get published, so we had to publish ourselves, in many of the reports that it wasn't drugs, that it wasn't criminal gangs, 
that what it was was aspects of overcrowding and aspects of low proportions of staff. And by the way, you said you were meeting the targets, but you're we not meeting the targets. So, no, please, please let me speak. Please let me speak. So, I, I understand, I understand, but, um, right. So, we came back with all those results, and Secretary of State, it is disheartening. It is disheartening after all that research and the many, many, many meetings we had with your civil servants, explaining to them, presentation after presentation, what was going wrong in prisons. We worked in many prisons, many with, and with many prisoners. That none of that has come through. Actually, that's not fair. The one thing that has come through, which is great, is that you are talking about increasing the mental health literacy of staff, which is fantastic, because hopefully that will have an impact on self-harm and self-inflicted deaths. But the rest, Secretary of State, hasn't come. Please, I'm the first woman that's spoken in this, in this forum so far. I'm the first one. I am the first person who's actually, like, in, so far. I, I am asking a question. I'd just like to get to the young man as well, so if you could, um, please do um, ask, ask a question. I have asked the question. If, if you hadn't interrupted, I would have got to my question. Which is Secretary of State, why have we not seen any of this coming through? Four years of research with several hundred prisoners. Why has this not come through? I'm just going to take one from over here and then you can respond to both of you. Uh, Secretary of State, David Alexander, I'm from a community interest company. We're specifically focusing on transition support for people leaving prison and reconnecting with society. So I'm very grateful for the uh, cross-government group. My big question is, is there any specific variation between gender in prisons? You've talked about some very significant issues. Are you seeing differences between male and female prisons? Um, first of all, to de deal with your uh, question first, David, in terms of that there are differences between the nature of the prisoners within the male and female uh, estate, I think there are uh, different challenges, uh, if you like, and there's been a lot of work that uh, my colleague Philip, Philip, colleague Philip Lee has done in terms of the uh, women's offenders uh, strategy, uh, and I think we do need to look closely at whether uh, uh, we, we uh, develop a more tailored approach uh, and look to see what we can do in terms of uh, the uh, w w in terms of women offenders, and in particular, I come back to the point that's been raised about whether we can reduce the uh, number of women in prison is something that uh, I, I would be keen to explore. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the issue of, of 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 drugs and overcrowding and, and and so on, I come back to the point that I made earlier. We do need to address those fundamental basic conditions. I think that is right. But I think it would be wrong to believe that drugs is not a significant problem and holding us back from making progress on things like rehabilitation. Uh, that the issue of, and, it, and it's grown in recent years very strongly, uh, the sense I have talking to uh, governors, for example, is the way in which uh, behavior driven by drugs whether it is, if you like, behaviour having immediately taken the drugs or whether it's the, the fact that people have become indebted to the drug suppliers, all of that um, gets in the way of prisons doing what they need to do. So I think we have got to both address those basic conditions but also deal with drugs. And if you're going to deal with drugs, um, you've got to deal with the organised crimes that are increasingly, organised criminal gangs which are increasingly at the heart of what happens. So, a couple more questions. I'm going to take the two women at the back next to each other. Good morning, Secretary of State. I'm Anne Fox. I'm the Chief Exec of Clinks, representing the 1,500 strong voluntary organisations in criminal justice. I wanted to welcome your focus on rehabilitation and on understanding the purpose of prison. Um, more people work in those 1,500 organisations than are paid to work in prison and probation services. And I suppose I wanted to ask what role the voluntary sector has in the cross-departmental work on reducing reoffending that you've mentioned that we welcome. Also, as Deputy Chair of the Pharma Review for your ministry, I'd also welcome greater elaboration on the role of family ties in rehabilitation and the link between the implementation of that review and the reforms that you've set out. Thank you. Pass that. Oh, that's fine. One more then. Here. Clean sheet. 
Jane Gould, clean sheet. We find um, jobs for ex-offenders nationally. Um, the question I want to ask is, there seems to be no link-up between best practice in our prisons. So often on visiting a prison, I will hear of something amazing happen in, say, HMP Leicester, and something amazing happening in HMP Guy's Marsh. And wouldn't it be great if there was some sort of intranet, that, apart, quite apart from Twitter, that we all share these ideas on, that people could say, hey, that's a really good idea, let's share it. So fewer, maybe fewer personal agendas in prison and more a way to officially share best practice. Thank you. Well, first of all, on the point of best practice, let me, let me take that as a, as a very constructive point and, and one that we can um, look at. And in terms of uh, uh, ensuring that best practice is shared, that, that is obviously a very good point. And um, you know, if there's more that we can do on that, uh, I would be uh, keen to pursue it. As someone who has spent uh, a bit of time in the past couple of months visiting prisons, I think we have to you know, recognise, I gave a, 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 you know, a speech today that highlighted a lot of the problems that we have in prisons. We shouldn't also forget there's a huge amount of really good work that is being done in prisons. I was actually up at uh, HMP Leicester um, not that long ago and really impressed in the way that, uh, you know, a, a potentially difficult local prison, Victorian, pre-Victorian prison, but uh, has made a lot of progress in the course of the last uh, year or two. Uh, and I think a lot of this underlines the importance of, of good leadership within prisons. Uh, the point in terms of the voluntary sector, I think is really important uh, on that. You, you talk about the sort of cross-government work and, and uh, uh, we had a discussion yesterday uh, amongst a number of cabinet uh, ministers in terms of dealing with re-offending and a point that came across I think from all of us is the, uh, the potential role that the voluntary sector can play, well indeed the role it's already playing but the further potential that can be, uh, can, uh, uh, be achieved here so I think you're right to highlight that. And in terms of family links uh, I think you make a good point and there's no doubt that there's a strong connection between uh, family links and reducing re-offending. Uh, as I highlighted in, in, in my speech, I would I'd be keen to explore what more we can do to improve levels of communication between prisoners and their families, what new opportunities, so new privileges that can be earned. Uh, I'm certainly not talking about taking away anything uh, that exists at the moment, but in addition to what happens at the moment, is there more that can be done, an incentive to uh, ensure that people uh, uh, behave well and improve their access to, uh, to seeing their family? So I'm keen to uh, pursue that. Okay, two more questions. Um, Roland there, and then the lady at the back. Thank you. Uh, Roland Carthouse from Matter Architecture. I'm an architect. Um, I'm, I'm, I very much welcome uh, um, return to interest in use of Rottle. Um, uh, but there's an obvious tension uh, in the uh, sort of crackdown on uh, contraband and the use of Rottle. And I just wonder what more role uh, the, the physical state of the prison environment and the design of prisons can play uh, in supporting Rottle and whether that can be an explicit part of their design objectives, because I'm not, I'm not sure if that's the case at the moment. Uh, Amanda McIntyre from the Stefano Foundation. We work with parents to break the cycle of domestic abuse, which is, of course, a big part of the story yeah. for mothers and fathers um, in prison. Um, can I ask you to say a bit more about your commitment to supporting the mental health of prisoners, and especially urge you to ensure that that work is trauma-informed, because most of the prisoners have had so many adverse childhood experiences, it's their complex developmental trauma that needs to be addressed as part of achieving the behaviour change that you want to achieve so much. Yes, on, on, on that point, uh, I, think, I think you raise a, uh, a, a good point, and I'm struck by you know, some of the good work that is already done within uh, prisons, but if we can go further, I think there are great opportunities on that. And there's, there's no doubt that the issue of mental health um, within prisons, 
mental health for prisoners after they have left prison is really important and I think we need to ensure that there's, if you like, the continuity of support that is provided there. Uh, and, and your point about trauma is, is, is a good one and you know, I've seen some of the work that uh, is undertaken in some of our prisons on that and, and took some encouragement from it. But if there's more that we can do, uh, then I would be keen to, to, to support that. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of Rottel uh, and the um, if you like the physical design of of, of, of of prisons, I think all I would say at this point uh, is that I'm keen to explore whether there is uh, more opportunity here that we can get more prisoners uh, uh, getting release on temporary license. That 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 if you like we um, actually it, it to some extent touches on my point about continuity of support for mental health. But the point of being in prison and being out of prison isn't quite the jump that it might be. Uh, and one way of addressing that is ensuring that people are uh, used to working, that they can get into that routine of working, can prove to themselves that they're able to uh, work and hold down a job. So uh, I take the point about the challenges for the physical estate, but I think what I want to stress today is the degree in which if we're prepared to uh, give those prisoners who have earned that right the ability to go out and work more, then I think that is ensuring that they are better prepared for life outside prison, and, and we are all winners from that. So, and we'll wait, the Secretary State needs to go in a minute, so I'm going to take three, and then we're going to wrap up. There's, there's a lady who's been patiently waiting right in the corner over there, and then uh, this young lady there, and then... Uh, I've gone for women this time <laughs> with in the middle. Thank you. Secretary of State, Diane Curry, Chief Executive Partners of Prisoners and Family Support Group. And I was going to ask the question about what you thought about the role of families in the rehabilitation of offenders, but my colleague Anne Fox has quite rightly said that, that question before me. So I divert my question to another review that we've been involved with, which is the LAMA review, and how you may take some of the recommendations and the findings of LAMA in relation to disproportionality in the prison estate and how prisons may start to work with the larger and increasing numbers of, of prisoners from BAME backgrounds. Thank you. Siobhan Bailey from One Plus One, actually building on Anne Fox's comment on the Lord Farmer review. Um, there, there are also 200,000 children of prisoners in the country or in the region that, um, that are, are you know, struggling and often forgotten about. Can we hear a little bit more about what you're doing to support the families outside of, um, of prison as well as the prisoners inside as, as a huge part of the rehabilitation progress? And the final one here. Thank you. Um, my name is Penny Parker from a small organisation. We just piloted a project in Wandsworth last year called Standout. Um, and just want to ask um, how we ensure joined up thinking. Um, so you mentioned that one of the strategies that is awaited is in, on employment and uh, um, education, and uh, that will be, I'm sure, eagerly um, read by people when it comes out. Much of the work around employment is done uh, by third sector organisations, and I wondered whether you'd like to comment on the um, recently announced and currently open HMPPS grant funding round, which in fact expressly excludes employment outcomes from any of the um, grant funding that is available um, and uh, that seems to be at odds with a policy that you're proposing to introduce which focuses on that. I think on, on, to take the, the last point first, um, uh, so I, I am uh, keen to pursue uh, policies that uh, encourage employment uh, but it is the case that HMPP uh, S have to make an assessment on best value for money, what is the most effective way of uh, using their uh, grant funding in terms of uh, achieving that. That can be some, mean that there are some difficult decisions that have to be uh, made, but um, as I say, we have to uh, consider what is the most effective way of deploying our limited uh, resources. Uh, in terms of uh, the LAMI review and uh, BAME, um, I, I'm, I'm struck, this point strikes me, strikes me quite a lot, very often uh, the justice system, the prison system is you know, a long way downstream, that there are a lot of problems that if we need to address this, we need to address upstream uh, as, a, as well at the prison level. And I, you know, it's, it's really important that we have a system that is uh, fair and perceived as being 
fair. I think there is a question, for example, about whether the current incentive system uh, that exists within prison, which I've talked about, uh, whether that is seen as fair, particularly by uh, BAME uh, prisoners, uh, and, and that's why I think there might be scope for some improvement in that. Uh, and we need to ensure that, uh, that, that our system is, is socially just. And then on Siobhan's point about children, I, I think I come back to that point about fully recognising the need to ensure that family ties are strong, uh, that uh, that, uh, that means uh, I would like to see an environment where we can increase, if you like, contact between prisoners and their families uh, beyond the, the, the sort of levels that exist at the moment as of right, but in addition, uh, further contact. Uh, and I think there are opportunities as a consequence of new technology, for example. And I mentioned in my speech the uh, uh, point about Skype, uh, so that uh, we move away from face-to-face -face contact, which is, you know, which is obviously great and important. I mean, we still have that, don't, uh, but in addition to that, we don't just have telephones, uh, but we can actually have um, uh, uh, Skype as well, so that that uh, uh, improves those contacts, those family ties can be stronger, so that when people are released, we, you know, we know that families can make a real difference to people's willingness to you know, take responsibility, to comply with the law, uh, and uh, that, that's, that's something I'm keen to develop. Well, we've got a lot of questions, and I'm sure there's lots of others that people want to, to ask, but didn't get a chance. But thank you very much for coming t today. And can you join me in thank you, uh, Secretary of Justice? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Well done.